Hey, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our session on leadership and millennials. So I'm joined today by Maeve, Matthew, Kathy, and Eric. I'm going to let them all do very short introductions because you have the long biographies all on your app. So please make sure that you do have the app open. Um, this is a session on millennials. So if we're not top of the leaderboard in terms of comments and posts and photos, we'll clearly be doing something wrong. So what I'm going to do is ask each of the panelists just to say a couple words about themselves, why they're passionate about this subject, and also talk about what we mean by millennial leadership. Should we be talking to you today about how we lead millennials, how we prepare millennials for leadership, or indeed how millennials are already leading. So what's the most important thing for us to focus on this afternoon? Maeve, can I start with you? Uh, thanks, Susanna. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Maeve Quarren. I am one of two uh, owners and CEOs that run a business called the Foresight Factory. We are a consumer analytics company. We specialize in trends. Uh, and I suppose I will talk uh, this afternoon in some capacity, at least about trends for millennials, if there is indeed uh, such a thing. So I think it's a fascinating subject because why label such an enormous bunch of people globally with one single title that's often associated with things they really don't want to be associated with. And I think it's really fascinating always to pull apart the differences that sit within that group. Um, are they genuinely different to other generations? Um, and of course, you know, how they and the rest of us will, will shape the future. So when it comes to the leadership question, you know, I'm interested in what will leadership be about in the future? And, and is that genuinely different for millennials? Question. Matthew. Uh, my name is Matthew Swift. I'm originally from Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, I'm the chairman and CEO and co-founder of Concordia. Uh, we're a globally focused uh, nonprofit organization based in New York that facilitates public-private partnerships for social <laughs> impact. Uh, we're also the largest convening forum during the UN General Assembly in New York. Uh, I'm very excited to be here today, uh, first out of great respect for what this institute's done and what, what, uh, what Mr. Milken has created, but also uh, to talk about this subject, because uh, I, op I have the good fortune with my job to operate in politics, to operate in business, to operate in the nonprofit sector, and there are some very big challenges uh, facing the world, and, and, and that's one of the things talked about here at this forum, that's one of the things we talk about uh, at, at our various summits, and what is the role of millennials in addressing a lot of these issues? Uh, I tend to be one of those that worries that we overthink it a little bit. Um, and so how can we have an honest, direct conversation about what motivates this generation that has, to some extent, inherited an extremely complex uh, world with some major, major issues? Perfect. Catherine. Hi, my name is Catherine. I'm one of the founders of a company called Decoded that started in East London probably just over five years ago, teaching 10 people how to code in a day around wow. a kitchen table. And uh, fast forward to where we are today, um, we taught over a quarter of a million people face to face, many, many more online, 85 different cities, but essentially I'm managing a team of digital divas. <laughs> so uh, they're all under 30 and they're all coders, data scientists, hackers, uh, entrepreneurs and we're growing really quickly as a business teaching people demystifying the dark arts but how do I keep them motivated what do they want you know and it is it is really interesting and I just scrape the definition of a millennial but I'm really different to the people in my team who are you know 26 25 26 and what they want okay, brilliant Eric uh, hi, I'm Eric. I'm half Norwegian, half Spanish. I live between London and New York. I love avocado and all these things. I feel like uh, <laughs> I can speak for the millennial uh, crowd. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm CEO of Stable. We're a hedge fund seeder, which means we give uh, talented hedge fund managers capital and we also help them uh, run their business. A bit of sort of audience participation. If you take the 40 top hedge fund managers of all time as defined with how much money have they made, which doesn't mean they're like nice people or anything, but let's use that as a bar. Uh, what do you think the average age at launch is? Oh, aggressive. 32 and a half. Mm -hmm. So, you know, quite a, quite a young industry, quite entrepreneurial, quite startup-y. 
But in terms of definition of millennial for me, what I like to argue is that millennials aren't as bad as they seem, particularly in asset management. Age is a good thing, particularly in Europe, sort of gray hair, you know, um, having a surname that everyone knows seems to be really the requisite, which I'm not sure is a good idea. <laughs> They're a bit more entrepreneurial in the US, so that's why I spend half my time there. And uh, I'd like to argue that most millennials are probably a safe pair of hand if you diligence them well enough. Great. So, Eric, you talk about um, millennials from a very hipster, Shoreditch, liking avocado sort of way. Um, may you say that, in fact, we're stereotyping and creating a group. Certainly in our research at Brunswick, we've seen that there's a massive difference between a millennial who is in Boise, Idaho, versus a millennial that, yes, is in stereotypical Shoreditch. Do you think we're making a mistake in thinking about them as one sort of homogeneous group? Uh, yes and no. I think there are definitely things that set uh, the millennial generation apart from, for instance, even young people as they were a generation ago. Uh, they're not always the things that you think. So, uh, for instance, we talk a lot about the trend of liquid skills, the, the, the overwhelming desire uh, of millennials to be in constant training programs and to be constantly bettering themselves and pursuing all manner of self-fulfillment. And it's not that that's not true, it's just that it's equally true for absolutely everybody else. Um, but there are things that do genuinely distinguish this group and distinguish them from every other uh, cohort as well. So their interest in uh, causes, in communities, you know, it, it doesn't just run skin deep. Uh, there is a term that also goes with that along the lines of pop radical. You know, have we really changed the political fortunes of our world based on this newfound passion for cause? Absolutely not. But there is something genuinely still still there, and you know, I'm, I'm happy to elaborate on that. Um, one of my pet topics but um, you know to, to come back to, to your question there's a huge amount of diversity there also Millennials is a Western term for sure um, and uh, one that comes with that you know, bunch of stereotypes. It doesn't apply across the board. You've obviously got big differences within that group. Uh, obvious things like uh, millennials who are now parents. Um, but the, you know, some of the things, I suppose we find that millennials, generally speaking, even with those global differences, even with emerging markets thrown into the mix, they, they, they often still do have more in common with each other than say they do against boomers. Um, but what's more interesting in terms of pulling them apart, in terms of you actually having a conversation with them or attracting them for talent or selling them something or just generally understanding any consumer is the, the detailed level of segmentation that you need to get into. So actually we find really interesting differences when you got into things like what defines your personality, uh, the extent to which you were a liberal individual or, or more conservative in your voting patterns, you know, all, all sorts of slightly more uh, uh, nuanced views of how to break down that population. I think that's where you get into much more interesting, much more comprehensive view of you know what is an enormous cohort of people. Th that certainly um, meshes with our research, where we found that that actually things like education, whether you're from a mega city or a town, actually had far more impact in terms of the way people looked at the world from globalization to immigration to all of those topics than actually anything to do with, with age. Um, Matthew, you're nodding. Um, what do you think in terms of some of these sort of millennial groupings and how we need to, to really think about how we engage with them? All right, well, let's, let's start with as an employer, right? I, I'm an employer of millennials. Um, and I've spent a lot of time with people who've advised that unless you have yoga classes in the hallway and let people work from home whenever they want, all, uh, somehow millennials aren't going to be happy and therefore you're not going to get the best out of them. I'm a firm believer that you treat people with respect, you manage them well and efficiently, you pay them on time and people are happy. So I think it's a little bit overdone uh, to some extent to this uh, sort of analysis. I think uh, millennials are responding to the environment with which we and as a millennial, we're brought up in, right? Uh, we are uh, fast learners when it comes to cell phones or computers or video games, which makes us uh, more technically skilled in that area, in the digital area. That's just a natural product of uh, the environment with which we were brought up in and the technology as it relates to um, our age and the generation that we have. Let's think about millennials from a political perspective, right? Mm -hmm. 
Um, if you read the front page of the New York Times, it's going to sit there and say millennials are driving this, this agenda in the United States to drive the U.S. left. Well, millennial voting was down substantially yeah. in the last election. But then the follow-up question needs to be, well, how did millennials vote in general? And I think everybody would be surprised to know um, that it was much more balanced than people think. Uh, you can look at all the different reasons as to why that was, but I think again that caters to this thing, this this uh, concept that millennials it, it can be overblown in treating them as something completely different. There's no question industry disruption uh, is an enormous thing, but I thought it was fascinating last night at the dinner. The trivia question uh, there was a dinner for speakers, and the trivia question was a quote about transportation and the taxi industry in London and how it was about to be disrupted. Yet the quote was from 1910 or 1911, yep. I think it was. So it's important to put it in broader historical context. I think the the oversharing of information, the overabundance of information, is driving uh, an entire approach where we're overthinking how to employ millennials, how to treat millennials, how to approach millennials. Catherine, of course, you have lots of millennials in your firm and, and probably do do the yoga classes. I'm so living don't you the <laughs> cliche. So <laughs> tell us more about that. <laughs> yeah, you all walk in and find everyone doing a downward dog and kind of wonder <laughs> what's going on. Uh, but I mean, it is fascinating, really, when I think about we had our company meeting yesterday and we're thinking about doing no technology days, leave your technology at the door, 7 a.m. meditations, uh, 7 p.m. meditations, um, complete transparency, so anyone can read anyone's emails, potentially find out anyone's salaries, everyone gets to see all the financials on the business, um, anyone can opt not to choose for, a, uh, not to work for a client. I mean, there's lots of kind of, you know, you could be dismissive about the way that people want to work now, but actually, I do think that we are, the future of work looks different, and we know that it looks different. And actually, I like this idea of listening to challenging but honest observations on the absurd world of work that we have created and was created you know, over 100 years ago, that we work Monday to Friday, that we work 9 to 5, that we have weekends. And actually, this doesn't work for everyone. It certainly doesn't work for a lot of working women. And um, so seeing these kind of um, very intelligent, um, you know, talented young people that I want to keep in my business because they do not grow on trees, coders, data scientists, who can also educate and communicate, I want to listen to how they want to work because I tell you something, they, Amazon and Google cannot hire them. doesn't matter how much they pay them, they will want the quality of life that I'm offering them as a fast-growing business. And um, I think it kind of paints a picture of what the future of work might begin to look like. <coughs> we used to aspire towards working in big businesses, in big office blocks, and big office blocks got built and that's what cities look like and it's the reason we wear suits and what we wear. But actually, it is changing, and it's the reason that WeWork is valued at a staggering valuation. The way that people want to work is different, and the future of business is going to look different. And actually, listening to how a generation that hasn't kind of got used to it wants to work a vegan office, you know, healthy food, let's feed our minds. It's outrageous what we feed ourselves in some workplaces. I think it's refreshing. I think it is, I like to listen to it, and it means that my people stay, um, I'll have millennial leaders, and hopefully build a business that people want to work at in 20 years' time. And, and of course, it's already happened in schools, isn't it? Vending machines no longer have chocolate bars and crisps and, and all the bad stuff because we know about feeding minds. So it makes perfect sense that it should happen in the workplace yeah. too, where we need people to carry on with lifelong learning and not just arrive and then that's it in terms of development. Absolutely. And, you know, constantly asking what do you want to learn, taking learning sabbaticals. You say you want your people to be entrepreneurial, but you won't let them start up businesses and run their own businesses in their spare time. You know, um, it's, it's kind of challenging those things. I'd say 50% of the people who work in my business have their own businesses that they're starting up on the side, and it makes them better at what they do. You know, so it is, uh, it is, it challenges me, because I, I do feel I come more from the generation that is about traditional kind of view of hierarchies and work, but it's all been really positive listening to it and adapting and changing. And we were talking earlier about um, George Osborne last night, who was fantastic, but Chatham House rules, so we can't tell everything that he said. <laughs> but he did talk about how 
maybe a truck driver, so on, it would be harder to reskill that person. And you said nonsense. So <laughs> tell us why. We have taught a lot of different people, and I think that there is this sense of uh, people need to be given a permission to learn. And um, a lot of the people who work <coughs> at Dakota kind of, they were born with it for some reason, but actually a lot of the people that we teach have decided that maybe they're 70, maybe they're a CEO, maybe they're a mum who's been out of work for two years, and they've decided that, or they feel that the world has told them this is a skill set that you couldn't possibly learn or understand, whether it's code or AI or getting hands-on with quantum computing, for example, which like, I'm working on at the moment. I honestly believe I could teach anyone to do that. And I do think it's a mindset issue, and I do think that the qualities that you need to be a good a computational thinker or technologist are really um, you know, problem-solving skills. And I, I think that there's no way of really identifying who that skill set is. You, know, you self-identify yourself. Um, there's a school in uh, Paris called Ecole 42, uh, very successful. And one of the, the reasons they're successful is they're not basing entry upon previous academic records. And also, uh, it's free. And really, they're setting problem-solving tasks. So I would rather set a problem-solving task, open that up to every single Londoner to complete, and find the top 1,000 people who completed that task. And I guarantee you, within that, there would be people who hadn't completed their education by the age of 16. There would be a 45-year-old truck driver. There would be a mum who'd never worked in technology in their lives. And I also guarantee that I could transform them into a coder or data scientist in 18 months. Okay, there's a challenge out there for people. <laughs> so send somebody Catherine's way to see who can be reinvented as a coder. But Eric, um, how does all of this fit, the mindfulness, the yoga, et cetera, with mm. your <laughs> need to make a profit? Right. So we don't have yoga. Uh, we don't wear suits, actually. I had to wear a suit for this event because it's <laughs> business attire. So we're ahead of the curve on that one. Although that is interesting that you equated suit with business attire. Yeah, I think most people did. Uh, <laughs> maybe I read it wrong, but uh, uh, we're not now, changing the world yeah, yet. Maybe next year, a gilet or something. Exactly. But, um, <laughs> no, I think I think there's room for that in what we do as well. Unfortunately, asset management is a bit more backwards. You also have regulators and things like that, uh, which means everything is a bit more serious. Uh, conversations get recorded. Actually, hedge funds are quite famous for having. Well, there's one called Bridgewater that has this thing called radical transparency. You should uh, yeah, definitely... Uh, doing it. Yeah, <laughs> sounds like you are. It can get a bit aggressive. We, we're not quite uh, that transparent at our firm. But I really subscribe to what Catherine is saying about how to recruit and what we value in people. So we use a framework we call past, present, and future. And it's really about understanding the background of the managers we back. So past is things like... You know, what's the socioeconomic background of your parents? That's important to us because if you went to Harvard but your dad is CEO of a FTSE 100 company, then I'm not that impressed. If your dad worked at a Kmart and you went to Harvard, then I'm impressed. So it's really about, you know, the trend uh, of achievement, um, the difference between where you started and where you're at. Um, we also care about things like, um, you know, maybe you had minority parents. Uh, that tends to be good. Uh, if you lost a parent young, that tends to be a, a huge uh, predictor of success. So that's probably not a price worth paying. Uh, but it's still amazingly statistically significant. Um, in terms of present, we care about things like what car do you drive? You know, so if you drive a Ferrari, um, probably uh, <laughs> not for us. You're a bit flashy. Maybe you've made your money already. You're less hungry. Uh, we care about you know, how your family life is. Do you have a stable marriage? Are you happy at home? Divorce is incredibly distractive uh, from uh, producing results. <laughs> or how many hours a, a week do you sleep? You know, I, we ask that of managers, and they're like, that's the randomest question I've ever heard. And we're like, no, I think you're going to perform a lot better. This whole culture that sleeping less is better is bonkers, in my opinion. And then future is things like, well, what kind of culture do you want to build? And it all sounds a bit fluffy, but actually, um, the people who have great answers for culture building, or how are you going to compensate your people, or do you want to have like a hierarchical structure, a sort of primus inter pares? There's no right answer on those questions. But the difference in answer and thoughtfulness be between one you know, girl or guy and the next is absolutely incredible. And we're about sort of business building. So if you haven't thought about those things that smell a bit millennial, but actually they're just old school factors and indicators for success, then you know, you're probably not for us. Susanna, can I add to that? Please. So um, I agree wholeheartedly with bo what both uh, Eric and Catherine have said. And, you know, I have that population internally, too. I am far older and greyer than all of my employees, which is sad but true. 
Um, and, you know, many of them have bar embarked on uh, training courses internally, training courses externally, things that they run alongside employment with us. And, you know, the demands just keep coming and uh, we don't have an issue with that. That's that's fantastic. But I also feel like we're describing, you know, a, a micro population of uh, millennials um, and, you know, less than 10 percent of millennials globally want to be entrepreneurs. Most of them don't want to work for in their own business or for themselves. The vast, vast majority want to work for a major corporation. So I think there, there, there can be also a tension with, um, you know, the, the, I think there is a social norm actually emerging that uh, <sighs> entrepreneurial is good. Uh, you kind of have to build your own path for yourself. Uh, and actually we see huge swathes of millennials who are looking for stability and just quite classic routes to success. Um, and it's not that these things are mutually exclusive, that they're, they're both equally true. And I think it's important to keep it in, um, in perspective. And one of the things that we've always been I suppose somewhat taken aback by, and I think it's important um, just as a sign in terms of how we grow uh, business communities and particularly uh, for, for generations of the future is, you know, what do we do with things like entrepreneurialism when that requires a certain appetite for risk and adventure and challenge. Um, and we see huge numbers of millennials, in fact, you know, de definitely a growth in the <coughs> desire and uh, for risk. Uh, risk is very much an aspiration. But if you look at how many millennials, or frankly, uh, any member of the population, um, do they describe themselves as someone who, who likes risk? It comes very, very, very far down the list. And actually the top three aspirations in terms of what you want to be like if you're a millennial are organized, successful and creative. And uh, you know, you really more than anything just want to be seen as successful. So you know, I think I think there's a there, there's a there's a difficulty there. You know, having to push the boundaries because that's what you're supposed to do as a millennial. Uh, I'm not sure that's for everybody. I think it's just for for some people. I, I completely agree, and, and we have a lot of data that supports that too. And one of the things that I found most surprising was when we asked our it was 43,000 people in 26 countries. Um, what was most important to them in a job. Millennials, Gen X and baby boomers all said work-life balance. So every one of those generational groups said the same thing. And status and authority and, and actually even working for an organization which had a great purpose way down the list, which was not what we expected <laughs> to see. Um, you obviously do think that millennials are, are perhaps more politically engaged and, and do care about purpose. So mm. what, how would you respond to, to Maeve's feeling of some of that may be uh, almost a societal sort of pressure mm -hmm. to do that when, when that might not be people's natural instincts? Well, I think let's think about how we got to this place, right? <laughs> what drives a global CEO to all of a sudden care about some of the smaller communities that his or her company mm -hmm. operates in, right? That was driven by social media, immediate information, and the the potential liability that something happening even in the smallest of markets uh, could disrupt some of the largest companies in the world. And we've seen that, right? So then all of a sudden, a trend came about about purpose. Now, there's no question. I would go out of my way as an entrepreneur, a social entrepreneur. I would go out of my way as an investor uh, to look at companies that have some element of social purpose. One, because I think it's good, I think it's yep. healthy. I think the private sector has a very important role to play in society that they haven't always been invited to play. And, and nowadays, I think they do. Or at minimum, they're filling a very important vacuum, especially yep. at this time where we seem to lack a lot of strong global leadership uh, on, the pol on the government side, on the public sector side. Um, but also because it's good for consumer activity. Right. We now we're Concordia. We're conveners, and uh, for for instance, we do a great deal of work in the food space. Well, why do the largest food processing companies all of a sudden uh, express a lot of uh, interest in in certain issues, whether it be the humane treatment of livestock or um, it it be the the movement towards organics? Right. 
because consumer activity dictated that that was where they needed to go. How did millennials drive a lot of that? Because the access to information was so much more substantial than it has been for older generations. So again, I go back to the theme of saying, look at the trend, and, and yes, are things moving faster now? Probably, uh, certainly. Um, are things changing that much more? Do we, have, do we have the capacity to consume that much more information? Yes, I can consume in five minutes from going through my Facebook feed um, as much as, uh, to some extent, someone could consume going through every single page of a printed newspaper. Um, and so that all of these different things are changing. But really, I think millennials are just adapting to this ever-changing environment. And it should be read very much as just that. It's really fascinating. And, and in that context, perhaps, surprising then around um, millennials' awareness of how much things are changing. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the questions that we asked in our survey was, do you think your job will exist in 20 years' time? And an astonishing 72% of millennials thought that their job today would still exist in 20 years' time. Oh, wow. Which, yeah, exactly. So, which suggests to us that they're going to be disappointed somewhere along the line. Um, so one of the other things that came out in our research was the distrust <coughs> in business leaders, which I'm sure comes from the transparency that you're talking about and the access to information and, and so on. Do you think, and, and the stats were awful, 37% thought that leaders were honest and trustworthy. That is really not a very impressive figure. Um, do you think the way you're now running your business in terms of so much more transparency, and Eric, when you're looking for leaders who, who really have an idea of culture and, and what right looks like, do you think millennials will run their businesses in a different way? It's a big question, I mean, uh, that, but on, on that kind of idea of people believing that their jobs are going to be the same, I mean, in, and the purpose question that you were asking, you know, we, we attach so much purpose and meaning in our lives to these jobs um, that actually I think this kind of rise of needing um, to trust leaders, um, to have a sense of purpose and meaning, is a deeply human um, question. And this goes back to just what makes us human. And um, with the rise of artificial intelligence and robotics, and I'm sure many people met Sophia, you know, we're really kind of being challenged on, you know, what makes us human and what makes us who we are and why do we wake up in the morning and why do we do what we do? And, you know, those are the purpose questions. And, um, and I think in a lack of answers, to those questions, because I don't think anyone really has the answer to that question <laughs> yet. People look for really strong leadership. And that's not just within business, it's also within politics. Mm. And I think we're seeing, you know, this huge kind of rise of, you know, uh, very opinionated politics on the right and the left, because it can paint a very, very distinct picture of a purpose. And I think what we need is leaders who can kind of paint a picture of a future vision and a future purpose that's something really positive that people can gravitate towards, that uh, can kind of replace, you know, this, that can sit above jobs, sit above work, and sit above politics, hopefully. <laughs> I think it's something you can monetize <laughs> quite bluntly mm. as well. Um, you know, you see a 20% uplift in brand advocacy if um, from millennials if they believe their bank is a genuine brand. Mm. That's quite extraordinary. You know, millennials love to hit their bank. Um, and, uh, th th you know, this comes out as one of the most important things that's going to uh, effectively encourage them to, to, to spend money with a company. Um, we saw something like 103% increase versus the previous generation in desire to be involved in the life of uh, their community. And there's an awful lot of emphasis. I mean, I could 
go through four or five or six different statements that all um, congregate around the need for human connection. So obviously we all know that uh, millennials are the most connected generation ever, um, but that's not enough. They all say that they want more friends. They all say that they find it difficult to make friends. Perhaps that's because they're uploading versions of themselves that are entirely false in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, <laughs> you know, the, the, there's, there's a uh, there's a realisation, I, 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 I guess, because actually we've seen a real reversal in that, in that trend of performative perfection into a world where actually we're more prepared to open up and uh, expose some of our feelings in a bid to be liked. But the, the, the whole sort of what's real, what's genuine, what's human, how can I connect with other genuine humans is, is, is worth a lot of money. And your question about, you know, does that mean that businesses will derive profit differently in the future? I think they will, but not because we're necessarily driving a profit line just through purpose, actually because brands themselves that come across as authentic, whatever that is, um, and that's a pretty broad term, um, just genuinely attract uh, more people and more social advocacy and more um, uh, uh, word of mouth in a world that's incredibly noisy um, and you know that that's that's the best that's the best form of advertising there is frankly I think to the question of leadership there's gonna have to come a moment of reckoning uh, a young guy I went to university with ran uh, in a very high-profile congressional race in the state of Georgia um, and it was a it was a big deal in the political cycle because it was um, it was the to replace um, uh, someone who had gone into President Trump's cabinet and it was a special uh, special election so all the attention was put on this one congressional race now this young guy who I know to be a very very good guy um, uh, he and I knew each other because we were in an acapella singing group together right <laughs> so just keep that in mind as I tell you the story he was painted because of what he posted on social media as uh, a party animal, a, a guy who was totally unqualified because, um, uh, you know, they, they painted him as someone who just likes to sit around and drink beer all day, taking videos and pictures from his time at university. And so really it was one of the first campaigns where someone's social media uh, history going back 10, 12 years um, was all of a sudden used against him in an election, very effectively, by the way. So at some point, we're going to have to have a reckoning for two big reasons. One is everybody has flaws. And so the, the question is, do the millennial generation and, and future generations understanding this social media environment that we live in, are, they going, are we going to become more forgiving of that? Because if we're not, we're going to have a very hard time finding our next generation of leaders. And it goes back also to a lot of major political trends taking place in terms of who gets to the top. So let's start, for instance, in the example of Macron, right? A month prior to the election, it was uh, that he didn't have a chance. And then all of a sudden, he's one of the great leaders of the world. And the expectation game is set so high that it is impossible for this person to meet that expecta expectation game. Um, you look at the ability of a, of a Trump, right, to master more than anything uh, Facebook in a way that, according to his uh, head of digital, is the, one of the main reasons that got him elected, was his ability to use, um, use a platform. Um, but or know people who could use the platform. Yes, of course. But, it, but where the question, though, is to what standard are we going to hold these people, and how do we weed out the good from the bad? And, and to what extent are we able to start to accept uh, flaws a little bit. And I think in the business side of things, in the political side of things, what we're going to start to see is a public that is more understanding of those with faults yet great skills at certain things that lend itself to leadership, uh, but continue uh, to never accept hypocrisy. And I think that's what's going to start to drive our leadership. So often it's not the fault, it's the hypocrisy to it that drives, that drives that. Because authenticity doesn't actually have a judgment assigned to it mm -hmm. in terms of whether it's good or bad. It's just being honest about who they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, quite. You, you define that however you, it's whatever that means to, to you, as long as you can own it. Yeah. I, think, I think it's fascinating to see you know, big brands around the world absolutely going with this. Um, let's slap it under the it's fine to be fallible. 
uh, label. So, you know, you've got Axe running a campaign, you know, hugely successful Unilever brand, been around, uh, frankly, a huge proponent of young male stereotypes for the last 20 years. <laughs> um, and now all of a sudden they're running a campaign which is all about opening up to the internet, you know, asking the internet your deepest secrets. Is it okay to, um, you know, uh, lie about your body odor or whatever it is? They're really deeply intimate questions, and this is being plastered all over uh, the internet. You've got um, Gatorade running a campaign, Make Defeat Your Fuel. You've got Diesel, uh, you know, very once exclusive, quite Italian designery brand now going with, you know, it's all about the flaws. It's mm. all about, you know, championing failure. And uh, you will know of <laughs> a trend <laughs> that I, I talked about recently this sort of vocal vulnerability that we, we now see trending through social media and, you know, the celebration of all the failure that we've been through. So, you know, uh, things like innovation, like uh, entrepreneurs all around the world coming together in communion to, to talk about their disasters. Uh, you know, this has become a hugely profitable uh, business venture in 80 countries around the world. And, uh, you know, it's got a, a particular Clearly choice title that goes with it, which involves an expletive, so I won't, you know, uh, uh, crack the camera screen just now with that. <laughs> but you know, it's a massively profitable business. So I think you're absolutely on the money with that, Matthew. I think there's huge profit to be had in in this opening up and this, you know, uh, we, we are not perfect. Uh, we all crave this, uh, you know, successful. But we're not all going to be Mark Zuckerberg. We're not all going to make it overnight. Um, yeah. And 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 let's learn from each other along the way. That that openness is is um, yeah massively uh, exciting right now. Eric, from a, an investment standpoint? Um, <clears throat> I really like the, the non-hypocrisy point uh, that Matt made. Uh, we tend to do pretty thorough background checks, and we tell you, you know, tell us now what's in your <laughs> closet, because we'll find out, and sort of that save, <laughs> save all of us some time and some money. Yeah. Um, it's what's interesting true. about social investors always do as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's interesting about social media as well is obviously there's a lot more uh, material out there uh, from when you were younger. What's really interesting about really driven people in politics and finance is that they kind of knew when they were 12. So like their social media presence, it's almost zero. The guys that are the hungriest, they're like, yeah, you know, at 12, I knew that if I like, you know, took a picture of me smoking weed, then that would come back and haunt me when I was, you know, raising my hedge fund in 10 years. I'm like, that's out of control. You know, I was like playing with GI Joes when I was 12. But um, <clears throat> I think there's a sort of self-awareness that if you've grown up with social media, uh, you know the price to pay. Yeah. I, I wanted to touch quickly on, on uh, something that was said on risk-taking. Um, we always tell our managers that risk-taking is a privilege, right? So I think it's become very cool now to have a startup, and I think it's been a bit um, made glamorous by the Zuckerbergs and the Snapchat guy who's like a billionaire, marries a model. It's very unique, uh, specific examples, and yet it's made entrepreneurship incredibly uh, cool and aspirational. Mm -hmm. But then what they most want is the work-life balance, okay? Mm -hmm. And that's insane, because if you're an entrepreneur, you work <laughs> 14 hours a day. In fact, one of our questions in our questionnaire is, how many hours a week do you work? And if you say something less than 60, it's a pretty short meeting. And <laughs> you know, we tell you, you're going to make less money, and you're going to work more hours than you ever have in your career. Yeah. Are you ready for this? And you know, if they're like, no, I want work-life balance, uh, well, then don't be an entrepreneur. That, the one thing that has helped millennials, however, which I think is also a bit of a saving grace, is there's this variabilization of cost, OK? So what do I mean by that? Like, you don't need to buy a house anymore. You can kind of rent. You can don't need a hotel room. You can go on Airbnb. And when you're starting a business, the cost of failure has come down as well, right? So you don't need to like buy a server. You can go in the cloud. And particularly in finance now, it's all sort of third party you know, vendors. The minimum efficient scale has come down a lot. So I would say, however, that the price of failure has come down. And that, I think, is you know, something good to do with entrepreneurship. But your work-life balance is going to be absolutely screwed no matter what. So, uh. And talking a little bit uh, to the, to the work-life balance piece, and, and I get asked all the time uh, from people uh, who want to be entrepreneurs, right? And, and, I, and I joke with my team. Some days I'll say, you should always start your own organizations. And a lot of other days, I'll say, never start your own organization. <laughs> and and, and I, so there is this sexiness to it that's been, that's been built up, and, uh, uh, which, which is good and bad, uh, I think, because it does set up certain people for failure. But what I would say to the work-life balance is I've had a lot of success in recruiting people who their, 
wh what I think that what is better than work-life balance is loving what you do so much that it isn't work. And I'm not just saying that as a cliche. Mm -hmm. I feel that way. I wake up every single morning, and I work seven days a week. I wake up every single morning, and I am so excited to get to the office. I'm so excited to work with the people that I work with. I'm so excited to do, and I'm very lucky in that regard, right? Um, to me, what I see with our the intern class that we have every year, uh, what I see when I talk to students, when I see uh, people who come to our summits, uh, people, their goal more than anything is to love what they do. And that, that in itself drives everything else. And then people don't mind working 24-7. I'm having a very millennial moment. There's a <laughs> meme. Uh, and there's this like, guy talking to his parents. He's like, uh, oh, choose a major that you love, and then you won't work a day in your life because nobody's hiring in that field. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I actually agree with him. I actually agree with him. I think it's a good idea. <laughs> Catherine, what I, did you want to add? I think about 95% of the people who leave Decoded leave to set up their own business, which wow. is uh, makes me very happy. Um, when I started, the, we were in East London. It wasn't called Tech City. We were all there because it was cheap. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't glamorous. There were a few coffee shops and stuff like that. Um, but it did become Tech City, and I think that's amazing because a lot of them, when they leave, number one, they'll go into an incubator like Entrepreneur First, incredible organization, you know, three or four years old. Um, and as part of the deal there, you get paid as part of that nine-month program. They mentor you, they coach you, you don't need to come in with a co-founder. So a girl I know has gone in there, she's about 26, um, self-taught coder, kind of early stage, but uh, teaming up with a data scientist, she's found her business partner, she gets to pitch, um, they then have funding, and I love that the risk is being mitigated. Mm. You know, why? I mean, it wasn't a nice journey when we started, and yeah. it definitely was the last roll of the dice. You know, yeah. that was it. It was the credit card loan. It was the, you know, if this doesn't work, you know, and it, that can be healthy, I think, you know, having that level of urgency as well. But, but I, I, it's also very unhealthy. And I think the other thing that I love is um, I have got into the world of politics a little bit, joining the board, uh, non-exec for the yeah. Department for Business uh, this year. And um, But it is interesting to see that isn't a natural choice for younger people when they want to solve problems and they want to uh, change things. They're actually empowering themselves, not necessarily with votes, but with code. And when I think how a lot of young people responded to fake news, one other girl that I know who... Um, is an entrepreneur, a young entrepreneur, about 26, a statistician, founded a company called New Opinion that was helping you create some visibility on your own echo chamber. Because I think that was quite interesting. That shocked me about how we created our own echo chambers. She coded that from scratch in six months, you know, and launched that. And that was her way of solving that problem. And so, I, you know, I think we can be quite dismissive about millennials sometimes. But a lot of the ones that I see, I just feel truly inspired by, actually. And, and l it's important to acknowledge uh, a red flag, right? And that is, it's great that we all get to be at something like this in a, in a nice hotel in London. But there is a growing population of people who, in my view, are facing an opportunity deficit yep. that is, is, is going to be a very big challenge for all of us to address. In business, in politics, um, what, what in civil society, what do we do to address, I mean, for instance, when we talk about education in the United States, we talk specifically about a population of people who took out a loan to go to university and dropped out. Because that $15,000 or that $20,000 in education debt might as well be a million for the jobs that they're going to get because they dropped out of university. So what happens to that population of, of millennials who have an, an entrepreneurial spirit, who, who take information at a very high speed, who are active on uh, digital platforms, who have the potential to become coders? Where do they fit into society, and how do we get opportunity to them? Uh, and so that, it's very important that while there's this uh, romanticize, romanticizing that we can do about millennials and about all the possibilities of the future, we can never forget that in society, it's always the growing issue that we, uh, we ignore or we kick the can down the road that 10 years from now ends up driving 
a lot of things that we can't anticipate. And I think to some extent, when you watch a lot of the political movements or uh, to some extent private sector movements happening around the world today, it, and the reason why nobody anticipated it is because we haven't been paying attention to that growing population of people who don't have even bootstraps to lift themselves up. And absolutely. And of course, part of the big challenge for millennials will be that that contract between employer and employee has radically changed, yeah. right? And we haven't necessarily equipped people for that change. Although it may, I think you would would argue that um, people are learning. Is it life hacker skills? What What's your? <laughs> That's a slightly different point. I think you know millennials are. Uh, they need to be, and they are uh, incredibly creative. And you know, it's not for nothing that mm -hmm. it's the sort of top aspiration f for everyone, and has been, by the way, for about the last thirty years. But it just keeps on topping the list even more intensely. So, and you know, again, if you look at business, there's just so many um, interesting marketing examples of companies building in a means to engage their future shoppers through little skills. So, you know, take something silly like the um, cosmetic chain Sephora. In all of their retail shops now, they've been completely redesigned to have a million different little booths. So you can have one-to-one -one makeup tutorials. Uh, you can uh, learn about style and design. You can do anything you want to do. And I think, you know, it's not just in the workplace that millennials, uh, or frankly, we, will look for, for skills and new and better ways of, of doing things. Um, and I think we were, you know, that, that ingenuity is, is absolutely desired. And it's one of the things that, that <laughs> continues to make us human. Actually, to come back to Matthew's point, there, there's a, obviously there's a partly a millennial solution to the problem that you've posed. <laughs> um, you know, one really creative business that has just started up in the US, and I think it's called Future Fuel, um, ha are mm. pitching ideas into <coughs> um, companies to effectively uh, have one of their CSR campaigns be the offsetting of the loans that mm. those students will have arrived into the workplace with because those are crippling. They're actually blinding their ambition. They are stopping them from going for other opportunities because mm. they're so scared to fail. So that's all, uh, slightly a generation along in that those people will have had some education. But already that, you know, if there's that sort of assurance, then that's one way of getting people through life skills and, and motivating to take on some risk in the first place it, through education. So I think, you know, there, there can be all sorts of creative solutions to these things. Mm -hmm. um, and doing skills differently uh, really high up on the list. The other thing I would say is it's not all about the technical skills. So incredibly important. And, and thank God there are people like Catherine teaching us how mm -hmm. to code, because what would we do? Uh, there are so many new skills to have to learn, particularly for older people who haven't experienced that along the way. But you know what we see in terms of when we ask young people about what they most want to learn about, um, and presumably this is already because they're a wizard coding and all sorts of tech skills, it's to do with things like, well, teach me about empathy. Uh, what does courage look like? Uh, how do I uh, have a healthy relationship with my colleagues? Can you teach me to negotiate? Uh, what does collaboration feel like? You know, lots of things that maybe in a, in a very digital context uh, perhaps haven't been as, as evident and as easily encouraged uh, things that you know my mm -hmm. generation would have taken for granted and you just watched and learned that it's less visible perhaps less tangible um, in a very digital environment and I think we need to pay attention to those things Thank you. I'd like to agree with that because last year one of our teams said that they wanted to teach storytelling in a day and I said no because <laughs> I said we only do technology education and we launched it and it's our second most popular product there you go so they were right and I was wrong <laughs> Okay, I'm going to open up the floor to questions in one minute. So before I do, I would just like each of you to say a last closing thought in terms of an opportunity and a risk for the audience that they should be thinking about as it regards to millennial leadership. So if you're in business, if you're in finance in some way, what should you be holding on to as the closing two thoughts? Opportunity risk. Eric. I thought you'd start with me. Um, mm. So for me, I, we haven't spoken a lot about uh, motivating millennials, how to manage millennials. That's something I think about a lot. Uh, there's a very cool book called Drive uh, by a guy called Dan Pinker, and he's identified three things that drives you. Okay. Um, one is um, autonomy, one is mastery, and one is purpose. And I'd guess the opportunity is 
And none of those things says money. So I don't think you need money to motivate people. I think the financial crisis has proven that. Lots of bankers that hated their jobs now do other things because they got paid less. So I think that was a good case study. Um, and, and the risk is you really have to get those softer things right. So it's all about measuring it, putting in processes like 360 feedback, uh, you know, secret Santa, all this kind of stuff that I think in my industry people think is you know, a bit fluffy and rubbish is actually quite important. So I think that's, uh, that's the risk that you kind of underestimate how important that can be even in a hardcore capitalist industry like mine. Catherine. I mean, I actually think um, the financial industry still attracts some <laughs> incredible talent. And I, I do think that it's about upskilling, reskilling. Um, you've got great talent, so it's really not that hard to do. And, um, you know, that allow people to be entrepreneurial. You know, there's so much great opportunity there. Don't be cynical, give them avocado on toast. There we go. Matthew. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I, I have to second, I think there's an enormous opportunity in uh, motivating people by passion for what they do, setting them up for success, um, giving them a mandate. I mean, I, I run a group that operates in one of the most expensive cities in the world. Uh, the people that work for me get paid a, a fraction of what their friends who work in the finance space get, and I would argue they probably work longer hours. And I think that's driven by a purpose, and that's driven. So the opportunity for that is huge. And that connects a little bit to my, my comment on risk. I'm very concerned about uh, what we face today, which is uh, not as many young people as we need are getting into government. And we, you know, we've talked a lot about the private sector and what uh, these startups can do and what entrepreneurship can mean. Good governance is everything, right? We do a lot of stuff in South America. Take a look at Colombia and Venezuela. If you looked at Colombia 20 years ago and Venezuela 20 years ago, totally opposite, right? Colombia, one of the most, at the time, one of the most dangerous countries in the world. Venezuela was a vacation spot, and then now it's completely flipped. So if you don't think good governance means something, uh, you're crazy because it can flip things so quickly, but what makes what I see as the greatest risk that we face is if people our age do not think of government and public service as a noble cause. Perfect. I'm going to go with uh, the risk of the label, actually, and the uh, you know unhelpful broadness of the label millennial. Um, and I don't think it just applies to this generation either. But I think you know, it, particularly as an employer, I think you need to know your people. They'll come in many flavors, and I think you need to truly dig behind what motivates them. And I think that that's uh, it's not that complex to do, but it requires you wanting to pay attention. Um, I think the opportunity, uh, and it, it's going to sound uh, like a particularly millennial term, but I think it's probably the biggest opportunity that, that we have in so many arenas in an automated world is that of empathy and, and teaching ourselves as business leaders what that genuinely yeah. means um, and, and celebrating what that means to teach ourselves and other people to be human and what really makes us unique. So that means things like, you know, wh what is your personality as a brand and using that to genuinely motivate your, yeah. your, your workforce, workforce and work with people and work with all of your uh, stakeholder interests, I think uh, it, it, it should not be underestimated. Thank you. Questions from the floor? Yeah. Oh, hold on one sec. We're just going to bring you the mic oh, because sorry. it's being recorded. Thank you. Um, I'm actually working here. Yeah. I was actually thinking about your risk pretty much the entirety of the, of the, the panel. Um, which is labels, um, because as a millennial born in 1987, I am definitely a millennial um, by that by that definition. But I don't necessarily identify as one uh, in the stereotypical sense. I suffocate in, in, in a work environment that has yoga and <laughs> meditation um, because I just need more structure than that. Um, from a socio, I guess a, a sociocultural or sociological perspective, are there? Sub labels, um, you know, subcategories of millennial that that um, sociologists identify that uh, we're teaching employers how to identify and how to nurture and manage. And what you mentioned earlier, you know, that's actually an interesting topic that I wish had been covered. Um, 
and I don't know if any of you know the answer to that. Maybe maybe you're uh, I can start to answer. I, I can start. I think we don't have useful labels for that yet. I think you know we're very much at the stage of can we can we just stop calling everything millennial um, <laughs> and, uh, and <laughs> thinking a slightly more sophisticated fashion about humanity generally. Um, I think uh, not that many businesses are well equipped to understand how to uh, decode people, um, and you know so one way in which we try to do it was just look at you know 20 different personality traits and you know whether those personality traits were strong indicators of other behaviors other um, uh, motivations other uh, ways to spend money other ways to <laughs> live life and they and they were hugely uh, polarizing actually um, so I think that we we haven't uh, come up with any labels as yet I don't think um, anyone has but I think they should and I think it, that's an opportunity uh, f from here and, and we have at Brunswick um, done a lot of work in this space too, and we actually came up with 48 different faces, um, faces. And, then, and then measured um, attitude towards all of the big subjects, um, looking just at, at well-being, about optimism for the future, about um, views on business, on motivations around being at work. So, yeah, we, we did cut it in all those different ways. And it was really because we found that that generation wasn't the biggest driver. Um, and, and so many of our clients are international clients that understanding that your people in a factory somewhere in Daytang, China, however old they are, are probably not going to be thinking the same way as your head office in New York. So, so we think it's it's incredibly important. Susan, I'm sure way. you're with me on this, but I, I, if I could make money on the number of incoming phone calls I take with the, how do I target millennials? <laughs> uh, it's it's just extraordinary, you know. And it, uh, from the hotel chain, that just builds a huge amount of real estate just for millennials. To, I mean, it's just sometimes it's ludicrous, the the mismanagement and the overuse of the label. So, you know, I'm yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm with, with your <laughs> frustration on that. Um, another question. Um, yeah. So, uh, f first of all, um, I couldn't agree more with your comment about finding your passion because um, I haven't touched the millennial <laughs> by a good couple of decades. Um, <laughs> and yet, when people ask me what is the key to success, I always say find the thing that is your passion, and then it won't be like work, and you'll wake up every day in which you had a hundred more hours in the day, yeah. and. Uh, and that, you know, uh, whether that's a work-life imbalance or balance, <laughs> it's a happy thing. Um, so I 100% uh, agree. But um, words of wisdom from the elderly. Um, <laughs> but uh, but my, my question is um, uh, something that I'm really bothered by, and whether this is a millennial thing broadly defined in the big category or not, one of the things that we're seeing, and all the polls are suggesting it, is this mistrust of traditional institutions mm -hmm. now. And this young generation, whatever you want to call it, uh, is deeply mis mistrustful now, whether it's the media, uh, whether it's politicians, whether it's the body corporate, this sort of, um, and you know, there's many reasons why that is, but if that is the case, things that worry me, when I think about a mistrust of the media, so then you now either reject media or you only listen to the media that tells you what you want to hear. Yeah. Mm. Either one of those answers is a bad thing, and there's no debate and challenge, so then there's no learning and there's no discussion. Just curious, from the seats that you sit in, r looking after that generation, how then do you connect, how do you create a debate and a discussion if the uh, entry point is, I don't want to hear it, it's just noise? Just curious. I, I think, I think you, you raise a very important thing and this goes to that moment of reckoning that I think has to come at some point whether it comes across all sorts of different industry sectors and, and, and all of that all at once or it it comes about over time Millennials and future generations have to make a decision um, at to what standard they hold institutions now uh, if you think of large government institutions and you think about the rise of political figures that advocate breaking them apart and, and, and really blowing them up, uh, right? Is that a result of the institutions all of a sudden becoming or perceived as corrupt? Or have they always sort of been that way and the transparency is what's shown that? I don't know, but I think we've got to be, you're right in that there's no, there has not been time nor a platform to have an honest conversation about these institutions. I used to work in the media space. and. Uh, my issue is less fake news versus real news or conservative news versus liberal news. My issue uh, is 
how companies in today's environment grapple with making money, right? And that's, it's, I'm all for the private sector, I'm all for free press, I'm all for all of that, but uh, it is always going to be a challenge as a news channel with 180 content, hours of content they have to produce a week uh, to produce things that continue to keep eyeballs on the screen. And that's always good. So where, where do we match what we as citizens are responsible and owe as a duty to society to the things that keep the lights on and keep things functioning? And I'm not sure we've hit that point yet, nor have I seen any kind of forum that, that is able to grapple those issues. But I challenge again, I don't think it's an age thing. I think kind of age no. is irrelevant. The is. two drivers of fake news and, uh, perception that are the largest are squared are actually rural versus urban and level of education, right? So it's kind of, you need to address those things, not really generationally. Uh, my mother's a diplomat, so she's very disappointed that I decided not to work for the UN. <laughs> um, and she reminds me uh, very often. But what I'd say to her is, I think the political class has left not a generation, but a socioeconomic demographic behind. And that's what you've seen. Like even in Brexit, if you break down Brexit, yes and no, uh, the younger age groups are actually equally divided. And it's all uh, sort of rural education, background, socioeconomic. It's fascinating. I think there's something interesting in uh, if my team were to show a PowerPoint presentation versus <laughs> get up and do a live coding demonstration, doing like hacking in something or doing a data visualization of this room, one is more captivating and believable and immediately trusted than the other. And I think we put a lot of trust in technology because it kind of came from a great place. You know, the World Wide Web, uh, this is one of the most democratic tools that's ever been created. Transparency, it's for everyone. But it's not for everyone, because how many people in this room know how to code? You know, like less than 0.01% of the world have the power. Right. So this hugely democratic thing that impacts all our lives, that is shaping everything and changing everything, is actually in the hands of the very few. Yeah. And I think that that has kind of shocked us. Yeah. Um, I don't think that that means that's where we need to end up. Um, I think we're going to need some very kind of digitally literate forms of uh, governance or truth standard bearing. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm an eternal optimist, basically. So I'm like, yeah, it's going to happen. Okay. We have time for one more question. A very fast one, and then we have to wrap up. Any more? Nope? Okay. In that case, thank you very much to all my panelists. Thank you. Thanks.